in the gallery. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7056 in the name of Alec Rowley on support for Citizens Advice Scotland's call to stop accelerated rollout of universal credit. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now and I call Alec Rowley. Mr Rowley, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank everyone who supported the motion that allowed this debate to take place today. I bring this motion here today to build the support of the Scottish Parliament behind the call from Citizens Advice Scotland, supported by much of Civic Scotland, to halt the rollout of universal credit and address the issues of concern. My point is quite straightforward. Why would any government in a civilised society continue to roll out a new policy that they know is going to hurt tens of thousands of people, drive people into debt, to rely on charity to feed themselves, and result in even more people in our country being driven into poverty. This cannot be right, and it is not right. And the Tory party must think again. Listen to Civic Scotland and stop this rollout. I raise this motion here for debate today after visiting various community organisations across Scotland where I heard firsthand the direct experience of people and what people are having to deal with where the rollout of universal credit has taken place. I not only heard the issues that people are facing, but the increasing problems organisations are having in trying to help people cope with this rollout. Citizens Advice Scotland published a briefing in July calling for a halt to the accelerated rollout of universal credit. On the back of this, I wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, as well as every MP in the country, asking them to support the call made by Citizens Advice Scotland. Every party and organisation that wants to help alleviate poverty should work together to ensure that people don't suffer as a result of this rollout of universal credit. The motion that we are debating here today highlights the problems that Citizens Advice Scotland have found in the pilot rollout areas. On top of this, only last week, 25 Scottish third sector organisations published a joint letter calling for the rollout of universal credit to be halted. This week, we have seen an intervention from the Church of Scotland, drawing attention to the experience people were seeing in churches across Scotland. It is clear to everyone that something is needing to be done to resolve these issues. Well, that would seem everyone apart from the Tories who seem to be burying their heads in the sand and are in complete denial of the facts. Alongside the letters I wrote to every MP in the country, I also wrote to Ruth Davison, urging her to lend her support to the calls made by Citizens Advice Scotland. But sadly, I've never heard back from her. I would appeal to the Tories in Scotland, to Ruth Davison's party, to get behind Civic Scotland and call for the rollout of universal credit to be halted until these issues can be addressed. I did receive a response from the UK Minister. The Minister for Employment wrote back claiming that the government do not agree with the conclusions of Citizens Advice Research. The Minister went on, and I quote, the report is based on evidence from a self-selecting group of people. This is just another classic example of the Tories denying that a problem exists as they continue to attack those least able to defend themselves and in the process drive up poverty in our country. The fact is that there has been a 15% increase in rent arrears an 87% increase in crisis grants and a massive increase in food bank use in areas where universal credit has been rolled out. It is not right to simply ignore this. 
One of the biggest problems we have heard in our time and time again with universal credit is the six-week waiting period at the start of the claim before payment. This is one of the things that is driving the increase in rent arrears and food bank reliance. What was the government's response to this? The minister said in his letter to me, many people coming to universal credit will have a wage for their previous, from their previous job to cover their expenses until they get their first payment. How out of touch is that Tory government? They are driving people into poverty, forcing people to rely on charity to feed themselves. And they simply assume people will have enough in their savings to cover their expenses for six weeks. They are wrong. Indeed, Citizens Advice Scotland published research earlier this year showing that 22% of the public have no savings to fall back on, while a further 24% had less than two months' income. This just goes to show yet again how much the Tories don't understand what day-to-day -day life is like for so many people in our country. Unless the delay period for payments is fixed, there is a huge risk of driving individuals and families further into poverty. The government should not be defending these issues, but instead recognising the problems that they are causing and commit to fixing them before they cause even bigger problems further down the line. It is clear the system is deeply flawed and we must work together to address that. I repeat, no government should inflict something on its citizens that is going to do more damage than good. No government should push people further into poverty. No government should be so arrogant to ignore the concerns raised by individuals, organisations and communities the length and breadth of our country. Until we find a solution to the problems found in universal credit, I urge everyone within this parliament to support the calls to halt the accelerated rollout. Thank you, President Officer. A couple of housekeeping issues. If you intend to be called to speak, you must press your request to speak button, and a couple of members haven't done that. And can I also say I have 12 members wishing to speak, and I'm minded therefore to accept a motion without notice under Rule 18.14.3 to extend this debate by up to 30 minutes. Could I invite Mr Rowley to move that motion? Yes, President Officer, I'm pleased to move that motion. It is encouraging that so many people are taking involved in what is such a serious issue. Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's agreed. I therefore call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr. Thank Mr. you McKelvey. very much, President and, Officer. And speeches of four minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thank you very much to Alec Rowley for bringing this debate to the Chamber, <coughs> a debate that I believe is timely and also imperative Timely because my constituents, the people of Hamilton, Larkhall and Stonehouse, who live within South Lanarkshire Council, are the next local authority to receive the full rollout of universal credit. And make no mistake, presiding officer, the reason why this debate is imperative, imperative because this botched rollout is detrimentally affecting lives. And that's just pure and simple. We are seeing people, not claimants, not customers, not service users, people, human beings, going for up to seven weeks without any form of welfare from the government. Seven weeks potentially without food, without electricity or other power, without sustenance, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, President Officer, I put that bit in my speech this morning before I heard some news just about two hours ago from the selfless volunteers that I know very well at the Hamilton and District Food Bank, the true heroes of the front line of defending people from Tory reform. They have advised me that they know of people who came to see them today waiting 12 weeks for any form of welfare as a result of the universal credit changeover. 12 weeks, three months, let that sink in. Imagine that was you or a family member. Essentially, what this rollout has achieved, presiding office, is a Tory-engineered, systematic shutdown of any form of life for the deserving poor. 
as they would put it, those who have the immense misfortune to find themselves in times of trouble, but are met with a desolate silence from the UK government, a bit like Ruth Davidson's answer to Mr Rowley's letter. It reeks of callous and cruel nature, which has become synonymous of this conser Conservative government. Since the partial introduction phase of universal credit within South Lanarkshire, my constituents have faced a complete myriad of problems, from significant delays in their payments, forcing hundreds into arrears, hunger and destitution, to an incomprehensible help system. What a laugh! help system whereby people are unable to contact the Universal Credit Processing Centre to resolve any of their issues. And whilst we hurtle at breakneck speed into the ever-growing digital economy, we can't leave behind those people who brought us here. We can't leave behind those who are lacking the technical online literacy needed to complete the deliberately, and I mean deliberately complicated DWP forms. And that's not hyperbole, but they are designed to be complex. They, are, they seek to exclude the vulnerable, the needy and the hopeless. They aim to divide and cause unnecessary hassle for those who somehow have the audacity to make a claim from this government. The evidence is there and it cannot be no ignored. Within the two authorities in Scotland that have the most experience of the full service, East Lothian and Highlands, approximately 82% in the receipt of universal credit are in arrears. This decision has real consequences. And for South Lanarkshire, to the tune of £4 million, this is the amount that they have had to put aside to mitigate the cost of the rollout. An absolute chronic waste of resources. That money could have been added to schools, houses, health, infrastructure, anything you want, all just to deal with a government who wants to demonise those at risk. Presiding officer, the risk to the safety of the well-being of women and children and regrettably children who will go hungry because this Tory government insists on continuing their failed attempts. Just let that sink in. Instead of heeding the warnings from CAB, from all of the charities, from local authorities, from welfare rights organisations, and listen to those who matter, the people <coughs> on universal credit, the Tories will continue to make children hungry to put their welfare in jeopardy. Presiding officer, I for one will not allow the Tory pursuit of ideological welfare reform jeopardise any of my constituents. And once again, I thank Alec Rowley for bringing this very important debate to Parliament. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balford to be followed by Polly McNeill. Mr Balford. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I apologise firstly to you and to the Minister and to the rest of the Chamber? Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave early. Um, now, with the extent of the debate, as I've been called to give evidence uh, to the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry this afternoon, the scale of change of welfare over the last three years has been dramatic, of which universal credit is one of the most significant and ambitious. I suspect the one thing we can all agree upon within this chamber this afternoon is that the current benefit system is extremely complex and claimants are entitled to different benefits from different agencies. Housing benefit from local authorities, uh, other benefits from HMRC, and so it goes on. So there is a wide support for the principle underlying universal credit, which should simplify social security by replacing a complex and chaotic system which has damaged people, held them back in dependency, and trap their lives for generations. The best way to help people improve their lives is to get them into work, to give them a purpose and to allow them to earn money. And the universal credit allows that to happen and will in time allow people faster and quicker than the previous system. East Lothian was the first local authority in Scotland to go for the full service in March 2016. Last year, I had pleasure to visit Musselburgh Job Centre, where Universal Credit is changing the way that the Job Centre works. Simpler administration, freeing up staff to meet with people face to face, employment outcomes that matter most. Sorry, I don't have time. I saw the way job centre staff embraced their the role as a work coach 
and how this was transforming the whole relationship with claimants. The digital take-up of universal credit, again, is a success story, with 99% of new claimants made online, which will mean that, in the long run, the service is more Please expedient down, and more user-friendly. Overall, 82% of universal credit customers reported that they were satisfied or very satisfied with the service, and the figures show that it is working in practice. Claimants are spending twice as much time looking for a job under the old system, and they're moving into work faster, with 113 people moving into work under universal credit for every 100 who are doing so under the pre-existing system. Now, when any new system is introduced, especially one as ambitious as universal credit, there are going to be operational difficulties. Citizen Vice Scotland is concerned, and rightly so, at the most vulnerable citizens. But we must make sure that that does not stop what is happening on the ground and that it's the, the success story, often for individual lives, is forgotten in propaganda from the other parties within this chamber. In East Lothian, the DWP are down. holding surgeries across the country every week to provide the digital support to claimants. I accept that for many people, the concept of having to do all the forms online is intimidating. But that has been mitigated directly by people who can drop in, no appointment, and giving face-to-face -face advice to do that. Universal credit is a single monthly payment. But as we all know, the Scottish uh, universal credit still remains a reserve to the Westminster. But the Scotland Act 2016 gave the Scottish Government the power to vary housing costs, elements for people renting their homes, and to alter the payment arrangements. And we took evidence this morning in the Social can Security you, Can you conclude, please? On this. Yes. I therefore support the rollout of universal credit. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I now call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Rona Mackay. Ms McNeill, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yes, indeed, universal credit was to be a new flexible system. All the things that Jeremy Balfour talks about. But no wonder, actually, Jeremy, you won't take an intervention on this. Because if your eyes were open to this, you would see that the objective that was aimed at for universal credit is far from where we are now. Universal credit rollout is an unmitigated disaster. It is before your very eyes. What more proof do you need? We've discussed many times in this chamber the six-week waiting period alone. I mean, it's, as Alec Rowley says in his opening remarks, it's an absolute nonsense that any one of us could survive without our salaries for six weeks, never mind no income for six weeks. Even if the government were prepared to fix the six-week problem, I would have some respect for the opposite benches. But they are just continuing regardless of this. But make no mistake, if there is no change and addressing of the problems of universal credit, it will have deep implications for Scotland because we already have discussed in this parliament the poverty levels. And so I'll just read out some of the statistics. Um, in Musselburgh, where the universal credit rollout started, the reference to food banks is now the highest north of the border. I mean, that is not a coincidence. I too went to Musselburgh as part of the Social Security Committee's inquiry and I sat next to um, a gentleman who was using a very small smartphone to try and do his form filling. When they make the calls to try and sort the issues that they're having, they are charged for it. I mean, you could not make it up. The effect of the six-week waiting period for a first universal credit payment can be serious and, as I said, lead to food bank referrals. It's causing mental health issues 
and it's causing rent arrears and it's causing eviction. The navigation online system that in theory would be a good one, if everybody was online then that would be fine, but there's still a high percentage of claimants and in fact ordinary Scots who are not, do not get access to an online system. Councils have pointed out that universal credit rules force homeless families to be put up in short-term bed and breakfast style lodgings to wait six weeks to qualify for rent support. And something they say is incompatible with the laws that require council to move those families onto more suitable accommodation within six weeks. Also, when they go to register for benefits, um, homeless people who are offered in tem temporary accommodation, be that hospital, hos hostel or bed and breakfast accommodation, do not state that they're homeless as often they're rough sleeping and they're put onto the wrong housing benefit causing them to receive underpayments. The Chartered Institute of Housing in Scotland has warned that the new universal credit to date has led to tenants finding it increasingly difficult to pay their rents on time. It's such an obvious thing, an obvious failure about the system. The welfare reform impact in a recent report published by House Smart Consultancy Group showed that the average rent arrears debt of a universal credit claimant was £618 compared to a non-universal credit arrears of £131. What more evidence do you need? In conclusion, presiding, presiding officer, it is a serious issue which we must get some action on. This cannot continue. It is deeply unjust and it will cause deep-rooted problems in Scotland for the sake of making some changes that are obvious to make for this system to be the kind of system that it was designed to be. Thank you. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Alison Johnson. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Alex Rowley for bringing this important and very necessary debate to the Chamber. Presiding Officer, the world's universal credit are misleading and cruel. They give the illusion of something for everyone, but the reality is anything but. Universal credit introduced by the Tory government at Westminster is merely a euphemism for more Tory austerity. It's the continuation of the attack on our poorest citizens. It's part of the wider destruction of the UK social security system. The same attack on the welfare state that's been called a human catastrophe for disabled people by the UN. Let me remind the Chamber what's happened in this attack so far. The Tories have cut £30 a week from disability benefit employment support allowance, hitting those unable to work. They've implemented the hated two-child tax credit limit, which takes money from low-income mothers and fathers who desperately need it. They've removed the family element of working tax credits, again hitting low-income parents hard. And young people aged 18 to 21 have been locked out of housing benefit. That's just some of the measures taken. Presiding officer, Universal Credit has got off to a terrible start and it's to be radically extended this autumn. This extension must be delayed. As a former board member of Eastern Bartonshire Citizens Advice Bureau, I was all too aware of the fears of the Bureau staff before the implementation of this system. These hardworking staff are in the front line and could foresee the misery it would cause to so many people already struggling to make ends meet every day. Sadly, their fears have been realised. With universal credit, benefits are paid in a lump sum, leaving many recipients unable to budget and increasing their risk of homelessness, food and fuel poverty. Eastern Bartonshire is one of the five bureaux piloting the so-called full-service universal credit. In, the, in these areas, uh, there's been a 15% rise in rent arrears compared to a national decrease of 2%. There's been a lot of statistics mentioned today, but I think they are worth repeating. Phasing out of disability tax credit means that over 110 disabled people who are in work are at, list of, are at risk of losing up to £40 a week in disability tax credits. An 87% increase in crisis grant issues compared to a national increase of 9%. Just think about that. Two of the Bureau have seen a 40 and 70% increase in food bank advice compared to a national increase of 3%. And, as we've discussed, 39% had waited more than six weeks, which is deemed acceptable by the Tories who evidently expect people to live in fresh air to receive their first payment. The fact that this application can be on, only be made online makes the process even more shambolic. Disabled people are the group in society that are least likely to have internet access. It's estimated that 35% of disabled people don't have access to the internet, compared to over 90% of the non-disabled population. 
Put simply, people are sinking further into deprivation thanks to a rollout riddled with error, and the rollout must be paused until key problems are addressed. No organisation would go ahead with a scheme that has failed so badly in a trial. But as ever, the Tories will plough on with their disastrous policy, regardless of the human cost. Presiding officer, universal credit is emblematic of the bitter and cruel treatment of people under this UK Tory government. Thankfully, the Scottish Government's approach to shaping our own social security system could not be more different, even with the limited powers we are receiving. In the name of humanity, will the Tories admit that this system is a disaster and stop the rollout? To err is human, but to compound a, compound a mistake is simply madness. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Claire Adamson. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Alec Rowley for securing this important debate today. We have heard much for, about the botched rollout of universal credit, and my own constituents in Musselburgh will know about the problems that have been caused better than anyone, as Musselburgh was one of the first areas where universal credit was tested. During the Social Security Committee's investigations into universal credit earlier this year, we heard and met with universal credit, credit recipients in Musselburgh of health conditions that had worsened because of the stress of not knowing whether or not they could pay the rent. We heard from others having to make endless numbers of calls on expensive phone lines, waiting anxiously for a callback that never came due to the call volume staff were experiencing, perhaps. And some told members that they'd had to leave their jobs, precisely the opposite impact Universal Credit seeks, um, because payment delays meant that they couldn't afford to pay for childcare. East Lothian Council has been faced with significantly increased demand for emergency payments, with applications for Scottish Welfare Fund crisis grants being 20% above what would be expected. And some universal credit recipients simply can't afford to pay the rent. In 2016-17, there was a 12% increase in council tenant rent arrears across the board. But for universal credit claimants, the figure was almost double at 22%. But issues with the implementation of universal credit and associated IT gremlins are only part of a much bigger problem. My constituents and people across the country are suffering, not only because the rollout is being botched, but because a whole raft of welfare cuts are secreted within universal credit. And so moving on to universal credit for many recipients means having to get by with less support than they might have received previously, as well as having to deal with some of the teething problems we've heard from colleagues today. Research by the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility shows that by 2020, universal credit will have taken about 3.1 billion out of the pockets of some of our poorest families. And that figure doesn't include the benefit freeze that will apply to universal credit. Sheffield Helm University suggests this will take another 300 million pounds in Scotland. And families with children will be the worst hit. A report from the Child Poverty Action Group and the Institute for Public Policy Research suggests that two parent families with children will be worse off by an average of £960 a year in 2020 compared with the income they could have expected in the absence of cuts to universal credit and single parent families by a staggering £2,380 on average. These claims aren't only made by the Child Poverty Action Group. I would add that this analysis is shared by the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility, which has said that universal credit is now, and I'm quoting, less generous on average than the tax credits and benefit systems that it replaces. In light of this, it seems like a very cruel joke indeed that the white paper that launched universal credit claimed, and I quote again, no one will experience a reduction in the benefit they receive as a result of the introduction of universal credit. The white paper also promised that 900,000 people, including 350,000 children, would be lifted out of poverty. CPAG claims that the opposite is the case, with universal credit putting around 1 million children across the UK into poverty. No wonder the UK government no longer make these claims and have repeatedly not responded to requests for a poverty impact assessment. I am closing, presiding officer. Um, I would just like to, to close by saying that Greens have previously called for the UK government to listen to the experience of universal credit recipients and improve it. And in light of these calls raised by Citizens Advice Scotland and many other third sector organisations and parties, it's clearly time to take action. Halt the rollout until the problems around universal credit are resolved. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Ms. Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Alex Rowley for bringing this debate to the Chamber floor today? Um, in the previous session of this Parliament, I had the privilege of serving as the Deputy Convener of the then Welfare Reform Committee. And in my duties, I contributed to a, a number of reports and investigations into welfare reform. I contributed to the United Nations investigation into um, the effect on disabled people of the welfare reform. And we know now that the United Nations has said that this is, will be a humanitarian catastrophe visited in the people of the UK by their government. In the face of this, in the face of the information that we've had from all of the third sector organisations, from CAB, those who signed um, the declaration asking for universal credit not to be um, rolled out, in the face of all of this, I cannot understand why the Tory benches cannot recognise what is happening in their own country. I had the um, privilege in 2015, no, sorry, I've, I've not got time. In, in 2015, I visited the pilots in the Highland to investigate how um, well universal credit was being um, rolled out there. We had a series of panels, including a DWP panel, um, which we were able to ask questions of. My over-impression at the time, it was a fraught with manual intervention process. It gave great concern about the sustainability and rolling out across the country. They had found fixes to problems, but the council and the um, third sector organisations involved with, were said that these were no way scalable, which gave them great concern for the rollout of universal credit. The rural aspects of universal credit were raised, transport time, expense issues for interview times, and also something already raised by Polly McNeill, amongst others this afternoon, the digital exclusion of people and the inability to access the internet to, to apply for um, credit. The seasonal fluctuating um, nature of some of the, um, the employment in the rural constituencies was also concern. concern. And they reported that 80 to 90% of those on universal credit were in rent arrears, compared to 12 to 15% of those not. The average rent arrears for non-UC tenants was £200. For universal claimant credits, it was over £1,000. And for those in temporary accommodation, it was £2,100, the average rent arrears. The universal credit uh, claimants were potentially in arrears from the minute they apply because of the five week period then in, U in Highland, but we've hear heard of 12 week delays this afternoon in the chamber. The DWP um, had no idea of the impact that this could have on landlords. And if nothing else, you think the Tories would be on the side of the landlords and the entrepreneurs. They had no idea that um, the housing benefit payment would cause an issue um, because they no, no longer had direct payments to landlords. And also the fact that um, in chaotic lifestyle situations where people moved um, uh, accommodation that the landlord might in fact receive no payment whatsoever. These things have been well rehearsed this afternoon. Many of the issues have already been raised by my colleagues. 2015, they were known about. For the Tory benches to continue to deny this human catastrophe <coughs> facing the citizens of our, our country, I'm going to call it out for what it is. They're picking the pockets of the Scottish people because we're mitigating for this disaster. Hundreds of billions of pounds mentioned by the First Minister at questions this morning. They're picking the pockets of the health service. They're picking the pockets of the education system. They're picking the pockets of every person in this chamber today. Our friends, our families, our neighbours. Please wake up and call this disaster out for what it is. Thank you. I call Alec Cole Hamilton to be followed by Sandra White, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise in support of the motion, and I should start by apologising for leaving early. I have to chair a meeting of a patients group that did not anticipate the extension of this debate. I often speak with hyperbole in this place about the various responsibilities that we discharge as decision makers, both in this parliament and in Westminster, but the safety net that we provide for those who, for whatever reason, cannot provide for themselves should be the measure of any civilised society. Now, my party has a proud history in the genesis and introduction of the welfare state in the early days of the 20th century with the first state pension under Lloyd George and in the 1940s under that great 
Liberal William Beveridge, who was the catalyst uh, for the advent of Social Security, when he identified the original giant evils, as he described them, of ignorance, idleness, squalor, want, and disease. It is a failure of progress that if you strip out that antiquated language, that many of those evils still hold sway in our society today. Pre presiding officer, we should remember that until this decade, and that since their introduction, the systems of welfare in this country had not undergone significant reform despite generations of incremental modification. Now, welfare reform itself was something sought by poverty campaigners, third sector organisations and academics for decades so that we could dispense with unneeded red tape and inject much needed social mobility into the system. It fell to my party in its period of coalition government to co-preside over, over this much needed redesign. I would, however, that we had had different bedfellows in that task. There are elements of, uh, of that system which now underpin the process that I take no pride in at all and aspects of the new systems that I still find shameful. Nevertheless, I'm glad that we were there for I dread to think of the welfare system our Conservative partners would have designed unencumbered and we all saw the measure of the ideological compass behind Conservative social policy in that ill-fated manifesto published by Theresa May in the spring. So today we debate the flagship aspect of welfare reform agenda, the rollout of universal credit. I support the motion today. It does not suggest that we tear up welfare reform or even junk the universal credit, but it does speak to the human cost of the inadequacies of its rollout. A large undertaking such as this may well have been expected to have teething problems, but the difficulties in the areas of Scotland where it has started go far beyond that, where people are switching over to the universal credit, have had, have had to endure a six weight, weight and more before receiving their first payment. This is intolerable in 2017 and a material risk to that person's well-being and that of their family. Put simply, presiding officer, it is pushing families into crisis. Citizens of Vice Scotland, as we have heard, have reports of many clients resorting to emergency stop gaps like food banks, crisis grants, food parcels, while others are going into significant rent arrears. So I rise in support of the calls of my colleagues on the Labour benches for the Parliament to support a total halt in any further rollout of the new system of universal credit until those errors have been given light to in this debate have been properly addressed. It makes no sense to plough on regardless, ignoring the huge impact on vulnerable families that has resulted from crucial payment delays. With 25 different stakeholders all backing the call to stop the process, we as a parliament must surely listen. The accelerated rollout that is due in October must be delayed to prevent any more people being pushed into financial crisis unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Sandra White, who followed by Neil Finlay. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer, and uh, I want to thank Alec Rowley, and uh, I very much welcome the opportunity to contribute in this debate. Uh, thank you very much for lodging the motion and giving us an opportunity to uh, basically call the Tories out for what they are. Uh, I know Jeremy, Jeremy Balfour had to, to leave, and I uh, uh, understand that, and with all due respect to uh, Jeremy Balfour, who this morning uh, joined the Social Security Committee, and as a convener, I welcome him there. Uh, but uh, words fail me for what Jeremy Balfour said compared to the evidence that we received, not just I, but the Social Security Committee, received at the Edinburgh the Job Centre there. What everyone here has said, a member of the committee and otherwise, is absolutely true. Uh, and uh, obviously it must have seen one thing. It certainly wasn't the treatment or the way that Jeremy Balfour saw it the way he apparently is, sees universal credit. We were taking evidence from various people, and it's already been mentioned, I don't want to go over the whole thing. But, you know, after we were finished, uh, a lady, well, during the evidence actually, a lady burst into tears. She had just received a, a text on her mobile phone to tell her that her money had been cut. Uh, you're sitting there, I, I just uh, mentioned the fact that these mobile phones to me seemed like tags because every single day they had to fill in their diary. A summary, as Pauline McNeill had already said, this had to be put in. What time basically did you do this? What time did you do that? Uh, how many jobs did you look for? What time did you go? Where were these jobs? It was like a tag on these people. And many of these people were very vulnerable and absolutely 
were even worse, as you can imagine, with this over their heads every single day. And that lady, you know, did burst into tears while we were speaking to, uh, uh, to the Musselburgh Job Centre. And that's the reality of universal credit. I'm not going to go over everything that uh, everyone has said, but the absolute reality of weeks and weeks, 12 weeks in some cases, uh, the fact that you have no money. You can pay, can't pay your rent, you can't pay your utility bills, you can't buy food, you can't even go anywhere. And this is supposed to be a civilised society. And this universal credit is supposed to be, according to Jeremy Balfour, the best thing since, what will we say, sliced bread. It's absolutely opposite. And, you know, people we spoke to have said, yeah, we need simplification in the social security system. And they, they, they didn't so much welcome open arms, but they were prepared to look at it and work with it. But what's happened is, it is an absolute diabolical mess, and it needs to be stopped now. And that's why I've signed up with various other organisations, individuals, to stop the, and halt the rollout of universal credit. It is literally, and I mean this really, literally killing people. And we need to stop that. People who are vulnerable, people who are disabled, uh, people with mental health problems, it is literally killing them because it is such a bad system at the moment with the rollout. So I do appeal, and I see there's a few uh, Tories there because they're the only ones who seem to think it's great. I appeal to them, please stop the rollout of this joint with the rest of this parliament, all the parties here, and admit that it's a mess and it's killing people. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. White. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Marie Todd. Mr Finlay, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and I have to leave after my speech. Um, uh, can I thank Alec Riley for bringing this vital debate to Parliament? I see today that we see the Tory party adopting the exact same practice as they practised in the rape clause debate. A one tokenistic speaker they have today. Four of them told to come here and sit by their whips, unwilling to take part in the debate. And where's Tompkins? Where is he? Where's the social security spokesperson who's supposed to be here defending this disgraceful policy? He's off. Three jobs, Tom Tompkins. No even here to defend the policy. And yet they lecture vulnerable and poor people about the benefits of universal credit. What an utter disgrace they are. I wholeheartedly heartedly support the anti-poverty organisations in their call to the UK government to pause the role at universal credit until all of these problems have been resolved. Given the impact it's having on my constituents across the Lothians uh, and the impact it will continue to have if it's not stopped, how that will impact on up to 600,000 Scots. Most people, most normal people are a, are a job loss, a relationship breakdown or an accident or a diagnosis away from the benefits system. I've been in that position many times in my life. Not all of the people out there are privileged like us to be on 60 odd thousand pound a year. Not all of them have got the opportunity to have two or three jobs or inherited wealth to sustain them. But this is not a discussion about other people. It's about everyone in our society who may at some time rely on that increasingly worn safety net. Citizens' Vice and others are rightly calling for a freeze uh, so to this policy so these issues can be addressed. And the impact of those new rules and policies relating to the administration of universal credit are causing, as everybody knows, apart from the Tories, dire problems for claimants. How can people possibly wait six weeks for their first payment. That is a lifetime if you're having to sign on for benefit. And as a former housing officer, I know the worry and strain that this puts on tenants, impacting on their mental health, their physical health, their well-being, causing anxiety, depression and hardship, and in some cases, as people mentioned, people taking their own lives. If we see crisis grants up 87% and food bank use up 70%, how can anyone tell us that this is a system that's working. How can you tell us that? It just makes no sense whatsoever. And I commend the Scottish Government for writing to the, cabinet, uh, writing to the uh, UK Government calling for a halt to this service. Unsurprisingly, that call went unheeded by the really caring, compassionate Tories. 
Um, and the SNP government stated that it will continue to press that case. I hope it does, and I hope all of the rest of us continue to press that case. However, no, more needs to be done, and CPAG and others uh, have suggested some way forward. That report last week from the United Nations on the uh, United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability on the UK government's performance and how it deals with disabled people should be, I, I don't care which party you're in, but surely you've got the self-respect to see that that is absolutely shameful treatment to all of the people in our communities who have disabilities. That's just absolutely incredible that you can't even bring yourself to say that that is disgraceful. I thought some of the people on those benches had more self-respect than that. This parliament will continue and must continue to apply pressure on the Tories. And I support the call by CPAG and others for greater investment in discretionary housing payments to alleviate some of these, these difficulties. And whether such additional, invest, in, additional investment might be required for a longer period and a longer, so we can get a longer term solution. And we need to increase the capacity on uh, advice services and all that they do in order to help the most vulnerable people. Can I ask you to conclude, Mr. Certainly. Finley, please? We can either use the powers that we have here to help people and continue to argue with the Tory government, uh, or we can do nothing while the poorest people in our society suffer even more. Thank you. I call Marie Todd to be followed by Annie Wells, please. Ms. Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and, and thank you, Alec Rowley, for bringing forward this really important matter for debate. I welcome this joint letter and the cross-party support it's received, and I hope that it will finally make the UK government take notice of the devastating impact that universal credit is having on people. Although given the response of the one Conservative member who's contributed to this debate so far today, I don't feel too optimistic. As members will be aware, Universal Credit is already operational in the Highlands. It was piloted in Inverness and it now covers the whole of Highland Council area. Because of the problems we encountered in Highland and in the other pilot areas, Angela Constance already called for the UK government to halt the rollout back in March to absolutely no avail. It's yet another example of the UK government not listening to the people of the Highlands and not listening to the people of Scotland. As others have said in this debate, one of the main problems is that new claimants have to wait up to six weeks before having their first payment and longer in some circumstances. I know it's difficult for people in privileged positions who come from wealthy backgrounds to understand but most ordinary people cannot manage to survive for six weeks with no income. Lengthy delays are resulting in tenants building up rent arrears and being pushed to seek crisis or hardship payments and turning to food banks. Myself and my colleague Drew Henry MP have been campaigning for many months to have the rollout of full service of universal credit halted. Earlier this year, we invited Jean Freeman, the Minister for Social Security in Scotland, to a round table and meeting in Inverness so that she could listen firsthand to the evidence of harm. We heard the story of a pregnant woman who was forced to travel to Aberdeen so that she could get a national insurance number before she could claim any money. We heard the story of lots of people with poor digital skills and connectivity struggling with no money. We heard how housing associations find themselves in the unenviable position of having to pursue tenants through the courts at huge public expense for debt that is not of the client's own making. And we heard directly from staff who worked in the council, who worked in CAB, in housing association, associations, all describing the distress that they feel at being unable to help these people because the removal of implicit consent means that they can no longer act on behalf of their clients. The client, that vulnerable person, has to navigate this impossible system on their own. 
the most powerful testimony that we heard at that meeting was from Macmillan CAB. They help people who are terminally ill to put their affairs in order before they die. These folk have a limited amount of time and they spend the last months of their lives worrying and navigating an impossible system. Any politician worth their salt would look at this Dickensian policy with its colossal design flaws and realise that it has to be halted. The UK government must accept that the rollout is not working and halt it until issues are resolved. How many more people have to suffer? Thank you. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Ms McGuire will be our last speaker in the open debate. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and to Alec Riley for bringing this debate to Parliament today. According to the latest statistics, an estimated 54,000 people in Scotland are claiming universal credit. Universal credit was designed to ease the transition from welfare into work. It was designed to reflect people's earnings and changes in their income month on month, and to reflect people's wage frequency, whether that is weekly, fortnightly or monthly. No one disputes that welfare should encourage people to work and that it should make sense for people to move, to keep more money as they work and earn more. That means responding to Please changing circumstances. If work is to pay, then welfare payments obviously need to adapt to pay. In turn, that means some form of assessment. The waiting period at the start of universal credit claim is a consequence of that. The assessment period, that is the month in which income first assessed starts within a week of a claim. There are significant exemptions to that. Anyone claiming universal credit due to a breakup, anyone with a terminal illness, a young person leaving care, a victim of domestic abuse and more. The first payments are made within seven days of the assessment period ending. Once someone is on the system, or if they have claimed universal credit or a range of benefits recently, they do not face the wait again. I completely appreciate and empathise with those who wait up to six weeks for a first payment, a period of time most would struggle to synchronise with common payments of bills month by month. And I am pleased to see that Lord Freud has indicated that the system rules out as the system rolls out, the weight should be decreased, which we should all support. I would welcome the DWP, DWP looking at further ways to reduce the time between the claim and payment. And I am certain the Welfare Secretary, David Gouk, will be answering direct questions on his, when he meets the lead signatory of the letter penned by Westminster MPs, MPs last month, Laura Pidcock, now that Parliament has returned. We have to recognise, though, that a responsive welfare system that recognises individual circumstances needs some form of assessment, and that this is a question of the best way to implement the system, not a question of the fundamental principles of the system. Universal credit is easing the transition from welfare Please to work. Down, Mr. Adam. Claimants are now spending twice as much time looking for a job un as under the old system, and 113 people are moving into work under universal credit for every 100 who were doing so under the pre-existing system. In accordance with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, work provides the best route out of poverty, and we know from the latest ONS figures that the UK employment rate has now dropped to a 42-year low in three months to June 2017, with the employment uh, please don't rate debate. rising to an all-time high of 75.1%. I'd like to end today with making a final point regarding the original purpose of universal credit in re redesigning and simplifying a notoriously complex welfare system of the UK. This was a move welcomed by party, opposition parties at the time of its creation, and I don't believe the support has moved away from the basic principle. During its early rollout, opposition parties were even quick to criticise the UK government for not ruling it out fast enough. I would again express my empathy for those who are waiting up to six weeks for payment and welcome any changes the DWP can introduce to decrease this time period. When it comes to the basic principles behind universal credit, however, we shouldn't forget what we originally set out to achieve on a cross-party basis. The principle of rolling several benefits into one to create one 
simpler benefit remains a good one to work towards, something I am sure we will still agree on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Wells. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by the Minister. Mr McGuire. Presiding officer, I'd like to thank Alec Rowley for bringing this uh, vital topic to the Chamber. So here we are, back from recess and back debating the horrors of Tory welfare policy. There have been several occasions relating to social security where I've thought that the Tories could sink no lower. The UN condemning their welfare reform as being in grave and systematic violation of disabled people's rights was one of them. But then we had the child cap and the rape clause. And now we have the UN describing the Tory government as having created a human catastrophe for disabled people. A human catastrophe. If you look up from your phones and let that sink in for a minute, maybe. Each time I've thought they could sink no lower, they've surpassed themselves. So I'm not gonna say that again today, because if I've learned anything over the past year, anything today, then that there's no limits to the depths of Tory callousness and Tory arrogance when it comes to this topic. Because when they're told about the damage their policies are causing, and they have been consistently and repeatedly, they dismiss the evidence and the concerns presented to them out of hand. When in November 2016, the UN first condemned their policies as being in systematic violation of disabled people's rights, the Tory government said that the report was patronising and offensive, and that Britain was a world leader in disability rights and equality. When the Social Security Committee heard disturbing evidence from groups such as the Black Triangle Campaign, as well as from trusted MSP colleagues about vulnerable individuals committing suicide as a result of distressing work capability assessments. The Tory Secretary of State in attendance said that he found it unfortunate that the issue was being politicised and that he disagreed with the analysis presented. When MSPs from across this chamber, with the exception of the Tory benches, united to condemn the horrific Tory two-child cap and rape clause, this Parliament's voice was dismissed by a Tory MSP as nationalist grievance stoking. And when the UN recently described the UK government as having created a human catastrophe for disabled people, the Tory response was to remind that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities, that the UK is a recognised world leader in disability rights and equality. I don't think so. So when it comes to social security for the Tories, trusted disability charities are wrong, respected MSP colleagues are wrong, this parliament is wrong, the United Nations is wrong. Last week, 25 Scottish third sector organisations published a joint letter calling for the rollout of universal credit to be halted. Will the Tory government listen to them? Perhaps our colleagues on the Tory benches today can tell us who they will listen to, and not just who their government will listen to, but when. How bad does it have to get before the Tories act? Presiding officer, there's a real danger at this stage that we're running out of words to express our horror at the damage being done by these Tory welfare policies. Where on earth do we go from human catastrophe? Now, we could be generous for a second and acknowledge the well-meaning thinking behind universal credit aimed at simplifying the process and helping people into work. However, the contrast between the stated intentions of universal credit and its reality on the ground could not be more stark. And as the evidence for damage, the damage it's causing mounts, I have to doubt the Tories' sincerity. If they want their stated intentions to be believed and they have to act immediately and pause the rollout of universal credit, they must listen to the evidence being presented to them and they must act on the issues going forward. This won't undo the severe damage that's already been done, damage for which there can be no apologies great enough, but it would prevent further avoidable damage from taking place. Continued failure to act would not only be astoundingly arrogant, but also willfully harmful. And for a government whose role is to care for its citizens, that would be unforgivable. Thank you. I call on Jane Freeman to close for the government. Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I too thank uh, Mr Rowley for bringing this important debate to the chamber. And can I express too my gratitude to the 25 third sector organisations who've already been mentioned 
to Citizens Advice Scotland and Citizens Advice England and Wales to the Church of Scotland for all the work that they are doing to try and press the case for the UK government to halt the rollout of universal credit until the problems are fixed. And can I make the point that all of that is based on evidence? It's not political posturing, it is evidence. Evidence, first-hand, personal, direct experience, dealing with real people, facing real hardship, seeing an increased use of food banks as a consequence of the problems with universal credit, an increased use of emergency aid like the Scottish Welfare Fund, where, what a pity Mr Balfour is not here to counter his stats on customer satisfaction in East Lothian, a 35% rise in crisis grant applications directly as a result of the introduction of universal credit full rollout. Coming from, as members have said, Mr Rowley and others have said, the six week wait, producing an increase in rent arrears and rising debt before people even begin to try and deal with some of the situations that they're addressing. This isn't about how well people manage their money. It isn't either about how uh, work is where people should be directed towards. 38% of people receiving universal credit are in work and are experiencing these very problems. This is about enforced anxiety, enforced debt, enforced poverty and enforced misery, enforced by a UK government. To Mr Balfour, I have to say this, that uh, description of how well universal credit is doing, utter beggar's, be beggar's belief. It is jaw-dropping in its simplicity and its refusal to acknowledge what is actually going on. And when Citizens Advice Bureau, which was one of the organisations that welcomed the initial policy intent to simplify the social security system, when that very organisation that still supports the approach to simplify the social security system tells you that you have to halt the way you're doing it because it has all that evidence of hardship, you ought to listen. And to Ms Wells, I'm grateful to you for reading out the DWP's PR notice, but actually your empathy and sympathy does not help address the problems of increased poverty, increased rent arrears, increased hardship, that the manner of rollout of universal credit and some of the fundamental policy components in it are causing to people the length and breadth of this country. And I am very grateful indeed to Mr Finlay. It's a pity he's not here. I hope he reads this. I am very grateful to him for calling out what is clearly the strategy of the Scottish Conservatives, which to sit on those benches when they're confronted by a debate about a UK government policy that is indefensible, to choose to speak and utterly ignore the points that are being raised and otherwise to sit silent. Well, let me tell you this. When you sit silent, you collude with the problems. When you refuse to address them, you collude with those problems. And we will never, ever let you off that hook. The UK government is not listening. It's, it is, as Mary Todd said in March, my colleague Angela Constance wrote to the Secretary of State, outlining in detail the problems of the rollout of universal credit and asking him to pause it and fix those problems. In return, we received a five-page letter extolling its virtues. There is no rationale for, in the face of all the evidence, all the experience, north and south of the border, for not pausing and fixing this system. So we are forced to conclude that the only reason can be utter contempt for the damage that is being done, arrogance about believing that you are always right, and a failure and unwillingness to admit the sheer incompetence involved in this rollout. So we have that unique combination of contempt, arrogance and incompetence, and let that be the final say on what this UK government is all about when it comes to social security. Yes, we have limited powers in this parliament and we will use them, but the DWP will charge us for that privilege. Those limited powers offering that choice on rent payment direct to landlords, on fortnightly payments, will be introduced. 
but we do not have the powers to deal with the most damaging aspects of universal credit, no powers to deal with the fundamental flaws. Social security should be there for all of us to help us and not trip us up. Our approach in this parliament shared, I believe, across this chamber, except by the Conservative benches, is a rights-based social security system, recognising it is an investment in all of us, as again, Mr Finlay said, and recognising that it is there to provide help and support. That is why our First Minister in the programme for government has said that we will publish evidence-based papers making the case for extending the powers of this parliament in key areas, including social security. Because if ever we needed evidence to demonstrate that we need to take those powers away from the UK government and bring them in to this parliament, which on the whole, with some exceptions, demonstrates compassion and humanity and an understanding about what social security is about, then the rollout of universal credit, the tin year that is thrown constantly by the UK government and Conservatives on these benches is a demonstration of the need to do that. I support this motion. I support or the call on the UK government to listen, to dial back the arrogance, to pay attention to their own incompetence, to halt the rollout and fix their broken system. And I say again to Conservative members in this parliament, either properly argue for a system that is fundamentally flawed, that causes hardship, that causes misery, either properly argue in support of that or stop colluding with it by your silence, by your false empathy and by your failure to take your own government to account. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament.